So to introduce our esteemed speaker is our esteemed chief scientist of CERT and the CERT Talks Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Barry Bain. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the second session of uh, CERT Talks. Uh, the first session we did, we did on model-based uh, system engineering. Uh, this one is addressing uh, something that is going to be extremely uh, significant for the future, which is learning systems, and, and, and in particular, how, how can uh, uh, computers be, to be, be uh, developed to uh, be better learning systems, and what happens when, as computers get to be better learners and uh, need to interact with, with people. Uh, so uh, fortunately, uh, our, our first speaker is uh, Grady Boot, who uh, uh, has a strong background in, in uh, initially software engineering. Uh, uh, he was uh, in the Air Force when, uh, when the Defense Department was developing the ADA uh, programming language and became one of the leaders in, in defining and, and evolving ADA. He joined Rational and uh, uh, worked with Rational on uh, how do you go from ADA to having a, a design language which is object-oriented. And, uh, and uh, at the time, there were quite a few of these uh, uh, separate design languages, and uh, Rational uh, took the bold move of getting uh, Brady and Ivar Jakobsen uh, and uh, Jim Rumbaugh uh, together as what were called the Three Amigos who uh, uh, got together and uh, unified their modeling uh, approaches into what became the unified modeling language, which is uh, sort of the standard for software and uh, is really the basis for the systems modeling language that uh, uh, is uh, the, the main modeling language for system engineering. Uh, uh, as uh, Rational was acquired by IBM, uh, Grady both became an IBM fellow and got involved in a number of other uh, uh, IBM activities, in particular the Watson Initiative. And so this is what he's basically going to talk about is uh, uh, what uh, IBM is trying to accomplish with Watson and uh, what are some of the implications of uh, having a Watson that uh, could not just uh, act as a computer program but act as a uh, uh, a part of a uh, learning system involving uh, the computers and people. So with that, uh, I'll uh, pass it over to Grady. Barry, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. It's uh, been ages since you and I have seen one another, and so I'm, I'm flattered by your introduction. Thank you. I was trying to get my video working. It did on the test yesterday, and of course, Murphy's Law applies here, so I can't seem to figure out how to show you my smiling face, but I assure you it's still here. So I'll just chat away for a bit. Barry, you, you gave me a lovely introduction, and it is the case that my life is sorted. Um, I've taken the work I have done in software engineering and begin, have begun to apply it to uh, systems that learn. So what I want to talk about today is really how I've taken that expertise to bring it to the Watson world and what it means next. <clears throat> what you're about to hear is something I could not have presented to you a month ago because we actually had this sort of hidden inside IBM, but now at the uh, World of Watson and at the Watson Developers Conference, what I'm talking to you now, we have, we have made manifest and visible. Um, the title sounds a little existential and actually it is. In another part of my life, I could probably give a whole another talk on this one. Actually, there are two different talks I could give in addition to this one. The first is continuing the thread of my software engineering work. One of the things that's painfully clear to us is that um, we are moving to a phase of building software-intensive systems that aren't programmed, but that we teach and that learn. And this has some really profound implications upon the software development life cycle. Um, such systems are non-holonomic in a way that the order in which I teach them and how I teach them 
actually changes their behavior. And furthermore, as I build systems of systems that involve many neural networks as well as non-neural networks, trying to orchestrate that within the software development lifecycle, trying to build testable classifiers, trying to build pieces that then work together, this is an interesting challenge for us. Uh, Isaac Asimov, in his books around iRobot, uh, posited the creation of Susan Calvin, Dr. Susan Calvin, a robot psychologist. And believe me, in our work on Watson and its future, as you see here in self, uh, such ideas are not so far-fetched. Trying to understand, debug, and modify a system that learns is a pretty gnarly problem. So that's a problem unto itself. The other thread in my life is working on a documentary for public uh, consumption, public broadcast, in conjunction with the Computer History Museum. It's the work we call Computing the Human Experience, where we are looking at the intersection of computing and what it means to be human. So this title is actually not so far off. As we start building systems that have emotional affect, that have the ability to recognize your emotions and indeed have their own personality. Systems that have not just reaction like Alexa, oh blast, Alexa just woke up here on my desk. Let me shut her off for a moment. One of the downsides of having a cognitive system. Um, the, 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 one, of the, the one of the implications is that now all of a sudden we are dealing with systems that look creepily like us. And it does beg the question, which we ask and try to answer in this documentary work of what it means to be human. So for me, this is utterly fascinating work that I've been able to, to contribute to uh, because we're dealing with stuff that's on, on the edge of AI. We're dealing with work on the edge of software engineering and dealing with stuff on the edge of what it means to be human. Now, I want to be upfront and tell you that I am not a cognitive scientist. Never was, never will be. I'm a systems engineer, tried and true. And so I've been approaching these AI problems in a subtly different way than most. I'm looking at it at a, as a systems engineering problem that involves many interesting AI aspects as opposed to an AI problem that needs to be engineered properly. And that causes us, as you'll see, to uh, look at the problem in some subtly different ways. So here's the elevator pitch for what my life is all about right now. Imagine taking Watson, and let's see if I can actually do this. There we go. Imagine taking Watson and literally put it in the physical world. Give it eyes and ears and touch and let it act in the world, not just with hands and feet, but also as an action of influence. For example, if I'm standing next to a person and I ask the question, where's the elevator? They don't have to say anything, but with a nod of the head, a wave of the hand, uh, these kinds of subtle things communicate. And it's that subtlety that we also seek as well. This is what we mean by embodied cognition. And here I'm borrowing a phrase, first, well, it's a general phrase in the cognitive world, but specifically I'm referring to it in the context of what Rodney Brooks speaks of. Rodney uh, from the AMIT AI lab in, in, in those days and now doing some tremendous things in robotics, observes that we probably can't have true intelligence unless you have embodiment. Uh, evolution has led to our current form of embodiment because we are in the world. And so we're taking this cognitive power of Watson, and I'm not trying to be a, an ad for Watson, but I'm telling you sort of general directions. Take that power, the cognitive power of the, the ability to reason and learn, put it in a number of form factors, could be a robot, could be an avatar, could be an object, could even be walls. And so we're therefore taking those systems and bringing them into the world. And this leads us to some fascinating possibilities for use cases. Now, I want to distinguish some things here. I've got an Alexa on my desk. I've got Siri in a few places. I've got Cortana on a PC. These are all certainly cognitive assistants, but they're more, at least in their current form today, largely request response kinds of AIs. <clears throat> if you study their architecture, you'll see it's largely speech to text, followed by a natural language classifier, followed by some action pipeline. 
uh, Amazon's Alexa has has codified that through what we call skills, and so there's actually a programming model. Uh, and what basically happens is that they take the utterance and classify it for you and put it onto the right uh, service, which then is handled by the service you create. Don't get me wrong, those are interesting, powerful, useful kinds of things, but they're not enough. We're speaking of embodied cognitions that go beyond that. So first, they're in and of the world. They have a sense of the world and they're physically in it and can manipulate it. They are systems that can reason and learn beyond just the response and reacting. And this one's a little bit controversial. We intend for them to have identity. I had a chance to uh, work with the guys who built Siri, first at SRI, onto Apple, and now they've left and moved on to a company called Viv, which was recently bought by Samsung, of all things. And they observed to me in the history of Siri that it really never caught on for the folks in the lab they were working with until they started giving Siri a bit of a snark. And now we could see that there was a sense of an other to which I was interacting. And this is the subtle line that distinguishes pure conversational kinds of things, which are useful until we actually start seeing an embodiment, the sense of an other with which we interact. At the extreme, you see science fiction like Spike Jones's Her. In the middle, you see things like, uh, like 2001's How. A little bit closer to where we are now, this is where you see the series Cortana's and Alexa's starting to develop a personality. And we're asserting this is actually a good thing. We have had millennium of years of experience of interacting with other humans. It is a reasonable way in which we might consider how we interact with our computers in the future. But it's reasonable to ask why now, why here? And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, I suffered through the AI winter back in the day. The term, by the way, uh, formed by Richard Gabriel at, at IBM, uh, wasn't at IBM at the time, but he observed that there was tremendous interest in, in some of the work going on in, in knowledge engineering systems. A lot of funding going to that direction, but it fell apart. And it fell apart for a variety of reasons, one of which is that we just didn't have the underlying infrastructure and now the algorithms, nor was it a sufficiently expressive enough approach that we could do all the things we wanted to do for a different place. And there is a tremendous demand pull. I keep using the word tremendous. So I'm going to ban that from my vocabulary here. There is a, an amazing amount of pull from the marketplace that's leading part of the work in embodiment. First, there's economic need. Uh, take a look at some simple statistics. Foxconn currently has a million, uh, a million employees on that order. And they have explicitly said they would like to eliminate 40% of them, uh, many of them working in, in, uh, in factories. They'd like to eliminate 40% of them uh, by automation. Uh, we're seeing de demographic changes that are leading a change in the marketplace. You go to Japan in particular, and here we have an aging population. The birth rate is not meeting the replacement rate of death, and so the population is actually shrinking, and this is creating a crisis in elder care where there simply aren't enough people to attend to the needs of the elderly. Uh, less so in Europe, but it's going to be there soon. And lastly, like it or not, there is revised military doctrine that is leading us to new kinds of scenarios. Now, that's the demand pull. There's also a technology push. We've seen uh, increases in computational power, some amazing advances in AI algorithms and architectures, uh, actuators, you name it. And we're in a different place than we were around the time of the, uh, the AI winter. And this creates, therefore, an interesting opportunity. It's no surprise, therefore, why we see uh, folks like at Google with DeepMind doing some amazing things. Uh, the work they did with AlphaGo and where they're taking their convolutional data uh, neural, neural networks is interesting. But if you think about it, the notions of neural networks are from the 60s. And many of the algorithms we see being used today are evolutions of those from the 80s. But now we have a very different bit of technology, computational power, that allows us to make it manifest. So um, let's see, did I go too far? No, here we go. So I talked about those form factors, and this is a subtlety that I, I want to expand upon. Um, when we think of these kinds of agents like Alexa, Cortana, Siri, 
they're largely boxed into a device, our phones, uh, an echo, a dot. And so when I talk to Alexa, I'm talking to a device. And Alexa doesn't really follow me around. But there can be other embodiments, such as what you see on this slide. And I should mention the work I'm about to tell you about, we've actually put behind every one of these things I'm showing you here. There's the uh, Now robot from Alter Baron, a uh, company largely owned by SoftBank out of Japan. Uh, we have a version of this running in the Hilton Hotel serving as a concierge. I've got one on my desk here, in fact. Uh, ABB has a whole line of industrial robots. And there's an interesting change going on in the marketplace. Um, we see certainly uh, an amazing amount of use of robots for large-scale uh, production. If I want to build you know, 10,000 cars, and I'll use these. And it's worth it for me to spend the effort, spend the money to program these things. But there are two problems with that, <clears throat> three problems. First off, these are kind of robots that are dangerous to be around. If I, if I create such a thing, I can't be near it because it doesn't know about me and would likely kill me if I get in the way. Second, it's not amenable to short production runs. So if I'm doing a hundred of something or just one of something or two of something, uh, it, the economics of teaching these robots is such that it's just not worth it. So what you'd like to do is to be able to have an embodiment that you can have it watch you and learn from that. And third, we know how to deal with rigid objects, putting uh, joints together and welding them uh, to even sub-micron uh, uh, tolerances. But if I have really, really high tolerances that require jiggling, or if I have flexible things like putting a sleeve on a, on a pipe, uh, this is something that uh, programming a robot does not easily do, but rather they have to learn. At the bottom, we have the Robonaut 2. Uh, if you've seen the movie The Martian, absolutely interesting uh, movie, great acting, great plot, but they miss some of the science. The current mission, NASA has, suggests that we actually put uh, robots on the surface of Mars before the humans arrive, and that's one of the experiments going on here. And then we have Sophia, one of the robots, humanoid robots from David Hansen. And there's actually a number of these kinds of things. These agents open up a number of use cases from elder care to industrial manufacturing to, uh, to concierges. But let's expand this a little bit more and, and look at, let's, let's see if we can get a handle on, on what I mean by those kinds of robots before we look at the other form factor. You can classify these robots from a variety of ways. They're either fully dependent, which are more Waldos than anything, or completely autonomous. Things like the Mars Pathfinder are kind of in the middle. They also might be fixed or mobile. There are many robots, especially those in laboratories, that you put them in one place, you don't move. At the other extreme, you've got autonomous devices that move in three-dimensional space. Yes, I put a drone as a kind of robot because it does act in the world. It does reason. Uh, you don't talk to it, but you said it. Well, you do sort of talk to it, but not in a conversational way. There are other kinds of robots that we move in place, do something, and then move them again. It's also the case we have some classes of robots that, that face only things, that they interact with things and humans program them, but humans get out of the way. The other extreme, well, we've seen some interesting research in uh, dealing with autistic children, and it is discovered that uh, such children often interact well with robots as opposed to humans for a number of subtle reasons. And so having open-ended human kinds of interaction is very powerful for certain scenarios. Robots like Kiva that we see with uh, Amazon are sort of in the middle. There is some degree of human interaction, but not a lot. And if Amazon has its way, you probably will eliminate the human entirely from the warehouse. And just last week, there was a notice of a, a patent they filed that allows a robot to pack a box uh, without human intervention. And they've already done a number of experiments uh, for picking and choosing without humans as well. Right now, it takes about a minute of human interaction for um, a person to uh, to to move uh, to uh, to deal with the package. By the way, we're on slide eight for those of you who are following along. Um, so the the end goal is probably to eliminate humans altogether. Slide nine. Um, 
there are another way you can look at robots, and that's relative to their determinism. Some are completely deterministic, and you want it to be that way. If I'm building 10,000 widgets, then I want them to look exactly the same, just ask Elon Musk. On the other hand, there are those that are completely socially intelligent and need to be open-ended and, dare I say it, opportunistically. Uh, some in the middle, like this cobot that you'll see if you go to CMU, are predictable, but they also have a degree of snark and a degree of conversational uh, responsiveness to them. <clears throat> Architecturally, we can look at robots from a number of dimensions, and this is where it starts to get interesting from an engineering perspective. Uh, they can be biologically organized. This is Rodney Brooks's approach to the world. You're looking, I think this is Genghis. And the interesting thing about his approach is to say, look, we know neural networks allow us to get some very powerful behavior. Evolution has shown this to us. And he has a particular way, what he calls subsumption architectures, uh, that allows us to, to build some interesting behavior. At the other end, you have more of the world of McCarthy and Minsky and, and really the AI, early AI uh, pioneers that were more symbolically oriented. Uh, where we're headed is kind of in the middle. If you talk to the deep mind folks, they'll tell you, oh my gosh, given a large enough neural network, we can do anything. And they are correct. Uh, you and I are existence proofs to that. That, uh, And I'm, I'm a materialist, although be it a spiritual guy, that's another hour of conversation that I won't go into now. Uh, but it, it is the case there's an existence proof that neural networks will get us some powerful behavior. And so at a certain level threshold of complexity, we can really do some amazing things, but we're a long way from that, certainly. And so at least in the foreseeable future, we're going to see uh, an amalgam of these two approaches. Additionally, you can look at it from the perspective of its client. Uh, we've got here uh, a, a small robot, uh, this again also from, from MIT, an expressive robot. Uh, which is a completely thin client. It's, again, lots of interesting mechanics, but all the smarts are offside. At the other side, you've got Atlas, uh, which is largely autonomous, autonomous and semi-autonomous, and so its smarts are inside the form factor itself. And, and in the middle, as you see on slide 12, this is Baxter, one of many kinds of robots in that space where there's local intelligence, stuff on the edge, but there's also stuff in the cloud. Um, slide 13, to level set it, Watson is a symbolically organized thin client cognitive system in its form today, but we're moving away from it. So that's the robotic form factor. There are three other form factors, and on slide 14, we have avatars. Now, this one has an incredibly high creepy cool factor. You're actually looking not at a baby. You're looking at a computer-generated baby. So this is from the work from a, a group of researchers out of the University of New Zealand uh, they worked with James Cameron on the movie The Avatar, and one of the many things that Cameron pioneered was the ability to put cameras on a, an actor's face, watch those subtle expressions, and then they could skin that to a non-human kind of figure. Well, these guys have done the reverse, and they just recently formed a company called Soul Machines out of New Zealand that does this. Um, so what they did is to build a model of the musculature of the human face and put a neural network behind it that can actually learn and mimic from you. So if I stare in, if I stand in front of one of these neural networks long enough, it will actually begin to mimic my particular uh, subtle ways in which I emote. And now you might consider let's take that, having trained such a system, and then drive it so that we could put a cognitive system behind it that could interact with us. Think of it like a robot, but in 2D space. There's one unexpected consequence that we found coming from this, and that is those who are deaf users, there is sufficient fidelity in these kinds of interfaces that they can actually read the lips of the speaker. Now, you're looking at a baby here, but you could actually skin it with anything. You could skin it with a, uh, a human, uh, an adult. You could skin it with uh, uh, Elsa from Frozen, a cartoon character, something in between. Uh, but that's what I mean by an avatar. We also see it in terms of a space here on slide 15. Now, this is also where it begins to get interesting. It's a notion that we've called Watson and the Walls. Bottom right, imagine looking in a, an elder care space where I've got uh, a person who is limited in their abilities, needs some assistance, and we also want to watch over them. This, by the way, was the subject of an EU project the last few years 
I don't think they're doing the competition anymore called Rockin' at Home. Uh, this bifurcates into uh, the problem of eating at home, where you'd like to have rooms that are instrumented, that watch over a person, that, that detect if they fall, that give reminders for their drugs, that look for their common patterns, maybe even has a device inside that could help do light things, like pulling something from a, uh, a bin or lowering and raising the, the blinds. <clears throat> but imagine Alexa, Cortana, Siri on steroids, but having an embodied cognition where I'm actually talking to the room. This notion can apply to, uh, to surgical units in the middle, you see here, of boardrooms. Uh, this is a, a, an experiment we're doing in a thing called the Cognitive Experience Lab. Uh, where you have a boardroom where there is a cognitive system in the walls that actually acts as another human uh, proxy for you. It takes notes, makes reminders for you, does things for you. You could also even apply it to a spacecraft or a cockpit of an airplane or a car. These are all what we consider cognitive spaces. <clears throat> and lastly, it could be objects. Um, going to the right side, uh, interesting experiment we found that uh, here on slide 16 that there is sufficient, if you instrument a chair, it is possible to detect the progression of diseases such as Parkinson's based upon the way a person raises and lowers them, themselves from the chair. And so imagine, therefore, having a, having a device that is well instrumented that does those kinds of vital, vital monitoring. Possibilities are quite amazing. So if you take the idea of putting cognition into the world and consider the notion of multiple form factors, all of a sudden it opens up for us a number of use cases that are really quite interesting. There's there are sets of clusterings here. So on the right side, we see that this offers, you know, home automation kind of things. Did I turn off the stove if you're away? Uh, lower the blinds, change the temperature. Uh, it doesn't have to even be the home, it could be the hotel. The difference, of course, is that in the home you don't change the people coming and going unless you've got a pretty strange home. or versus a hotel where you've got people coming and going. And there are also interesting security issues associated with that. Uh, greeter kinds of things like what we've done with Hilton, uh, being able to answer, do Q&A, but also having a sense of social presence with you. Uh, retail is kind of like concierge, except it might move in three-dimensional space. Imagine a, a cooperative robot uh, that can move about the store and take you to places, but along the way, do some other things like, oh, it notices some trash on the floor. It notices that uh, we're out of stock of something and then so subtly under the covers uh, attends to that. At the top here on slide 17, uh, this is where the elder care stuff comes into play, being able to respond to questions or, or, or agency like don't forget to take your pill. This is again distinguishing us from the series Cortana's Alexis because you like to have that degree of autonomy and agency as opposed to just reaction. On to the right side, <laughs> we've talked about the manufacturing cases. The get me a screwdriver is a particularly interesting scenario. Imagine I'm on an oil well, imagine I'm in a factory, imagine I'm on the space station, and I'm in the midst of doing some procedure, repairing a pump or something. Um, and I say to my cooperative robot, get me a screwdriver. Think for a moment what's necessary to make that happen. And this is, again, why it's a systems problem. Uh, first, it needs to know, I'm not in a bar, I'm in a spacecraft, so you don't mean a drink, you mean a physical tool. It might need to know the context of you're repairing this pump, and therefore, in the step you're in, I infer you need a Phillips head screwdriver versus a flathead screwdriver. And by the way, we left that screwdriver in the other compartment. Why don't I go get it for you? So that simple request actually can generate a number of very interesting bits of behavior, but it requires some fairly comprehensive context. Um, in the transportation space, the immediate thing that is interesting to many is putting this kind of thing into the car, but let me offer you a very subtle thing that brings these use cases together. And this, again, gets creepy cool, but frankly, it is actually possible. Imagine a cognitive assistant that follows me so I might be in my home, I've got, I'm talking to it in the walls, I walk outside, it's now following me in my phone, I get in my car, and that same cognitive assistant wraps itself into the clothing of the car itself, and so now has a different set of sensors and actuators. I'm now at my office, it unwraps itself from the car, and now is at my desk. So this kind of a scenario where 
the cognitive assistant is actually not in the device, bolted to the device, but moves along with me, we think that's both possible and desirable. Slide 18. So let me differentiate what we're talking about here from the Alexis Cortanas. First, it's more than a request response. It's also more than this conversation. Uh, Alexa today in these various, various kinds of agents don't really know how to interact with, uh, with devices other than fairly simple ones, and they don't necessarily sense in the world. So if the temperature is like this, then do that. This is in the domain of things like IFT, for example, or Microsoft's Flow. So we're getting there, but the average consumer is not going to be able to do those kinds of things. Agency is important in that regard. Personalization is important. And, and, and this leads to personalization not just of the agent itself, but also an understanding of the individual personas with which I interact. If I'm in a home, for example, Alexa does not easily distinguish between me or my wife talking to it, but imagine if it could. And, and learning, and this is, again, where it gets interesting from a systems perspective. <clears throat> I would like to build a system <clears throat> that is architected in such a way that it's ever-changing, that it learns not just from my simple speech, but learns from my behavior as well. The life cycle problems of that, they're they're beyond my understanding right now. They're, they're a really challenging problem for us. So if you apply those use cases and then consider the form factors as we see on slide 19, all of a sudden we begin to see there's an interesting connection of things. Uh, in the home, I might have the cognitive system in the walls. It might be presented as an avatar. There might even be a robot helping me about, might even be a device. In the case of like in a car, this is largely a space and cognitive space, but I might even have an avatar talking to me. So the notions of form factors is orthogonal to the use case, uh, but you might see the same form factor show up in multiple use cases and vice versa. Now the question is, how do we do that? Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is where my current work has been. And I'm going to tell you the background story that, that I've only told a few as to, to how we got here. So this is an effort we started a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and uh, we were looking at, at how people were using question answering systems like Watson and quickly learned that there are pieces that Watson does well, but there are pieces that Watson is missing. Uh, certainly it doesn't know how to interact with the world. It doesn't necessarily know how to build personas of people. It doesn't necessarily know how to have agency. So as we were uh, continuing this work, and here I'm on slide 20 for those of you who are following, this is our, our architecture, if you will, um, was exploring with what's a, a reasonable uh, a grand challenge for us to consider. We looked at some of the aging at home things, we looked at industrial things, and, and it hit me. Uh, there were three of us sitting down and we figured out, oh, we know exactly what it is. It's the HAL scenario. Um, when albeit without the homicidal features, by the way. So imagine the problem NASA has in going to Mars. Um, the reality is that it's far enough away that the speed of light issues intrude, and it takes, on average, sometimes it's much worse, on average of 17 minutes for a message to travel from Earth to the spacecraft or to Mars and back. And if you're dealing with an emergency, that's far too long. So you can't rely upon mission control on Earth to help you. Therefore, the engineering solution is you take mission control with you in the walls of the Orion spacecraft. Additionally, we'd like, NASA would like to put uh, robots on the surface of Mars to build facilities before the humans themselves, and uh, they would certainly need some degree of autonomy as well. So if you combine those two together, it led us to the question, could we actually build an embodied cognition that would serve the mission to Mars? And we came up with the answer of why, yes, we think that is actually possible to do. And again, viewing it not as an AI problem, but as an engineering problem. Now, this one slide I could probably spend several hours on and dive into the code, but I'm not going to bore you with that. But let me just briefly talk about it, and then I'm going to come back to it again to say that we're viewing the way that one can attend to that grand use case, which is some 20 years off, 
maybe longer, depending upon what our current president decides or decides not to do. But it also applies to the other use cases. We discovered that the architecture that I devised for the Mars mission helps us solve those other things as well. So generally speaking, what we've realized is that there is a way from a systems engineering perspective to fuse together symbolic processing together with connectionist kinds of models and then allow us to use both uh, Rodney Brooks's subsumption architecture together with uh, more symbolic architectures using blackboards and agents, and it seems to attend to all the use cases we spoke of. Now, this is the really fun and juicy part here on slide 21, and this is, this is what makes it an exciting problem. Because if you assert that those use cases are useful, if you assert that this is an architecture that can get us there, all of a sudden we have a plethora of technical problems that, that hit us. And these are wonderful and exciting ones. Uh, so let's, take a, let's take a simple use case, the problem of sensory fusion. Alexa doesn't do vocal recognition. It just hears an utterance, does it best it can, and tries to react to it. But that's not enough for me. Imagine that I have uh, the, the following. I have an instrumented room where I might have three sensors, uh, uh, audio sensors, so I can do some degree of triangulation. So if I speak, I can get some level of confidence that I know where in the room you are. That's an interesting problem unto itself. Let's now add to that a camera that can do some, some watching over of things, and it says, oh, I hear an utterance. It's roughly in this location in the room, and by the way, I see the person at that place actually moving their lips. Therefore, my level of confidence is even higher that it's that person. And if I add to it other context I might get by a vocal print, by looking at your face and doing facial identification, I can then say, not only have I heard the utterance, not only do I know where in the room it is, I know it's coming from you. So this kind of sensory fusion is a systems engineering problem that brings together some other classifiers that we know how to build and allows us to do some really interesting what we call spatial intelligence. Uh, jumping below that, uh, the notion of a theory of mind, and this gets us back to personalization. Uh, Siri has done well because there's a degree of snark, but that has to be contextual. If I'm dealing with a concierge in a hotel and I'm, I'm having a good conversation, a lighthearted conversation, a mother might run up with a child in tow saying, where's your bathroom? And you don't want to come back with a joke. You want to answer it firmly directly. This requires actually having a theory of mind, not just for the people we are interacting with, but also the persona itself. And this, this is where we see some really interesting intersection of UI, UI psychology, and, and stuff we're doing here. How does one actually codify a theory of mind? Well, we know how to read emotions of people. This is, this is a problem that's in motion right now. Um, we, we can look at a person and get some sense of their facial expression. There appear to be some universals. And from the collection of those emotions, we can build up a sense of personality. Uh, we know how to do that by looking at tweets already, for example. But, so again, we've got a sensory fusion problem. How do I build up an emotional and personality profile? We seem to be going in that direction, but let's go to the next level and begin to infer the goals and, uh, and morals and ethics of another person. Can I begin to infer that from seeing your behavior? And that's an interesting and fruitful area that we see some research coming into play. By the way, this is where we also see the interaction, interaction of ethics and the work we see here. There's the partnership in AI, which IBM, Microsoft, Apple, a whole bunch of others are in. Uh, and I think this is well and good, don't get me wrong, but I've been challenging those folks to say, please turn your PowerPoint slides and your papers into running code, and this is one of those places where that can happen. Um, let's see, off to the right-hand side of the slide, again, I could spend probably an hour on this one, uh, security has to be baked in. I'll give you a simple example. In a concierge situation, uh, generally speaking, I can legitimately take conversation and uh, video and send it to the cloud. 
unless here in the U.S. I see a child come present. And all of a sudden, legal uh, rules require that I can't keep that information. And so if I detect a small human of a certain age, then all of a sudden I've got to do this at the edge and not put things to the cloud. So that's what I mean by security having to be baked in. In all of this, context is, is key. And so, so having a rich degree of context allows us to do some powerful things. That's what leads us back to the very principles of embodiment, because here we're now dealing with systems that have a very rich contextual sense and therefore can lead us to some really rich kinds of behaviors. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about this, if you Google the phrase Project Into, I-N-T-U, you can actually go to a site and you'll see uh, a way you can try some of this stuff. You can, there's a gateway you can download this. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, a Macintosh, a Linux device, or a Windows device, and you could put it on a robot or just put it in your, in your machine. So go Google that and go give it a try. Um, I should also mention, I talked about the, the research behind this. Um, we, we've been looking at some specific areas uh, of research, but believe me, there are so many more things that can be done, and we don't have the time and space for it. So lots of opportunities for, for people to, to contribute here. Um, there's the tooling one I mentioned, the whole life cycle of these kinds of systems. My gosh, we are only beginning to understand how we deal with it. This is far beyond what one can do with, with agile methods and, and Git, because now we're dealing with systems that learn and that, that change over time. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done in the area of goals and planning. Uh, here's, here's sort of the end game. You'd love to be able to have systems that actually watch you and learn. We're trying some experiments in a medical setting where we've got a surgical tray, uh, a robot, uh, we're using some of the ABP robots that can actually manipulate these well, and then learns from the human as to what those things are on the surgical tray, and then begin, can begin to infer, are they in the right place, are the tools, are the to these the right tools I need at this point? Can I actually predict for you what you're going to need next? These things are all possible and desirable with the right kind of context, and it appears that the architecture I spoke of a bit ago is sufficiently powerful to be able to do that. Um, there's another interesting bit of work in what we call models. Um, this is the knowledge engineering problem, being able to build models of the world, uh, knowing where something is in the world, taking a point cloud and turning that into some degree of semantics. That I know that this is a point cloud, but this is actually a door sitting over here, or this is a chair, or this is a screwdriver. Uh, lots of interesting work going on in that space. Let's see, that's the background I gave you here on slide 24, how we came to this particular grand challenge. We're going to go to Mars. So l let's go to the next level here and, and talk about what all this means. Um, again, recognizing that I'm I'm an engineer, I'm looking at this from the systems problem, and there are a number of principles that are guiding me in some architectural decisions that led us along the way. We're not trying to replace humans, we're trying to augment them. We're trying to build systems that no longer do a program, but they learn along the way. Having a sense of theory of mind is central to us. And we'd like it to be platform agnostic. What we've described to you thus far really could apply across these form factors. They just have different ways of interacting with the world. So this is what leads to these major design decisions. So the system we call self is a hybrid one, and it brings together symbolic computation in the center with neural networks at the edges. So a lot of the advances, to be very frank, that we see in the neural space are what some call signal AI, being able to classify uh, images, being able to identify melanoma or not. Uh, AlphaGo is a bit of a different beast, but AlphaGo, as good as it is, suffers from the following limitation of existing neural networks. I can't go to AlphaGo and say, that was an amazing move, why did you make it? It doesn't have sufficient self-knowledge to be able to do so, but it's easier to build that kind of self-knowledge with symbolic systems, and therefore if I unify the neural networks together with symbolic systems, you can get some really interesting things. Additionally, our, our notion is let's take Minsky's ideas of society of mind, 
the notion of multi-agent systems from which higher level behavior can emerge and do that by allowing them to have multiple agents that communicate opportunistically through blackboards but also deterministically through peer-to-peer -peer connections and let's bolt that together with Rodney Brooks's idea of a subsumption architecture <clears throat> then all of a sudden you've got a fusion of two different approaches to AI. So these first three bits, um, these are the essential, I think, learnings we have found that say, from a systems perspective, in order to solve these new classes of use cases, there's some old stuff that becomes new again by putting them together in this systems way. Another important design decision is this notion of having a separation of concerns, just like the human brain is divided in certain perceptual ways. Now, obviously, it's much more subtle than that, but from a, uh, a level of, of degrees of separation of concerns, it's a, a reasonable separation here to say that we have some things associated with perception and actuating, some things associated with building models of the world and context, and others associated with behavior. And having that separation of concerns actually allows us to proceed independently on those parts uh, from one another. So back to where we are, we're here, let's see, yes, here we go. Back to where we are uh, to this, this slide on, on 27 to further illuminate this, illuminate this in the Center for Substance Center the Blackboard, whose purpose is to offer the current perceptual situation of the world. What do I see? What do I, what do I hear? What do I sense in the world? At the other extreme, I've got a model subsystem that has also a blackboard and agents, and its purpose is to, its responsibility is to say, what do I currently know about where I am at this moment? In the middle, this is where the, quote, thinking takes place. This is where the agents can carry out the behavior in the world. So again, a separation of concerns. So frankly, what we're doing here is no less than the next generation of Watson. But it also brings us together with another interesting thread, and that's the Internet of Things. As you see the, the movement toward billions upon billions of devices, to borrow a phrase from Carl Sagan, one of the, one of the things that, this is good, well and good, by the way, but one of the things that we begin to immediately face is that we have the physics of data we have to worry about. Large amounts of data weigh a lot, so to speak. Um, in the sense that if I'm, let it, let's say I'm in a, a, a turbine on my, on a, 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 on an airplane, or I have a, a wind turbine out somewhere in a field, I'm generating in this Internet of Things lots and lots of data that, frankly, I can't push back to the cloud. And so I want to move computation to the edge. And that means putting that embodiment in that device and being able to have the context of all the sensors and actuators in that space. So we see us on a collision course, therefore, with the Internet of Things, as things like Alexa, Katana, Siri become more intelligent, intelligent, their behavior moves to the edge as well. And this also gives us, on slide 30, the intersection of data and human presence as well, which is actually a good thing. Um, I'm going to skip over here. So I can get to some questions here, and you'll see some in the next several slides or so, if you scan through them, gives you a sense for sort of the, the spectrum of things that we're talking about. And so let me, let me kind of close it up here on the last slide to give us a few minutes for questions and answers. I can't emphasize enough that I'm having a whole lot of fun. This is sort of the, the next level of career for me. I did my thing in systems engineering, and now I'm trying to apply those to the wild and hairy world of AI to to attend to some really fascinating use cases that not only offer some pragmatic interest to us, but they do have the existential question of what does it mean to be human? This is a really fun time to be in this space and a lot of work to be done. So let me turn it back over to my hosts and uh, operators are standing by, as they say. I think we have time for some questions. Anybody have a question? So barely, Anybody the, have an answer? Yeah, I was going to say nobody um, can actually verbally cue that they have questions, and if they're anything like me, they're still digesting. <laughs> okay. Oh. Is, is there a site where they can type in a question? Yep, absolutely. They actually can access it through the uh, chat and question. But, uh, Grady, I think you kind of already integrated the, the one question that came up about the avatar 
um, yes. whether that was the, the computer visualization uh, was an image or a, a actual 3D model. Yeah, so to, to elaborate upon that a moment, what the guys at Soul Machine have done is they built a, a rigging of the human face down to the level of individual muscles, and now you can take uh, a, a, an image of a person. You do basically a, a front profile or whatever. It's easy to map it, and that becomes a skin that you put on top of it. That's why it looks so photorealistic, because there's um, a rigging below the surface. It's very, very real, but then you have the skin texture that is also from a photograph itself. And the cool thing is, like with the movie The Avatar, it doesn't have to be a human photograph. It could be a cartoon character. It could be a creature. It could be you name it. Yeah, pretty amazing stuff. Go Google baby slash X and you'll see some of the stuff they've been doing. It's, <laughs> it's mind blowing. And, this, and this it, by the way, we're not just at the uncanny valley. We we've, we've taken a big leap across it. Yeah, I'd say so. Is, is so is that movable? Like you said, the rigging underneath it actually moves. Oh yeah, it moves. It, it, if you look at some of the videos, you'll see its lips move. Its its eyes move. Uh, we we had a team down in New Zealand just this last week, and uh, it's pretty wild because its eyes will follow you. It's, uh, yeah, we we're 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 over the uncanny valley with this one. That's fantastic, uh, Kevin. I just unmuted you, so so feel free to ask your question. Oh, I see. Hey, Grady, thank you very much. Kevin Sullivan here from the University of Virginia. Um, quick question for you. What are the implications, do you think, of all of this for the education of future, <clears throat> I want to say computer scientists, but maybe I should say, you know, system designers? Um, expand your question for me for a moment, because the one answer, the simple answer I give to you is that I have stumbled upon a problem that is completely a systems engineering problem. And it, it's, I'll tell you that as much as I know about this space, it's pushing me because there, I'm discovering there are so many things I now know I don't know about how to do systems engineering. So this is, this is an exciting place to be. Help me understand your question a bit more. Well, you know, um, uh, uh, computer scientists tend to think about, you know, traditional programming and increasingly about machine learning. Um, yes. Systems engineers tend to think about processes and, um, uh, you know, system architectures and uh, uh, properties and trade-offs. Uh, but work in this space also requires an understanding of uh, human psychology, maybe social dynamics. Um, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, so the question, I guess, is are there implications for how we ought to be educating you know, the computer scientists, the systems engineers, uh, the social scientists of the future uh, to equip people to better uh, design and verify uh, and to do the meta design of processes for, for building, um, uh, you know, cognitive systems of the kind that you're, that you're talking about. A, a great question. Indeed, we're seeing it in the small as we try to have groups, not just ourselves, but we see it in other places, just even devising a conversation with a bot requires some degree of psychological understanding because you have to have context, you have to have some sense for how other humans might interact. So we're beginning to see, at least in the conversational space, the need for, and, and the understanding that there is a need for, a degree of interdisciplinary work. In the stuff we're doing here, uh, frankly, I've got psychologists, I've got cognitive scientists, I've got UI people, I've got systems engineers, hardware engineers, and we're trying to figure out what's the right way to organize these folks so that each of those stakeholders can contribute in the proper ways at the right time. This goes back to the principles I spoke of earlier, that having these degrees of separation of concerns actually helps facilitate that kind of organization because if I bash everything into one big wet hairball of a neural network, it's really, really hard to have those different groups contribute in different ways. So by viewing it as a systems problem with separable, nearly independent parts, it actually helps us bring in those folks. What does it mean for the future of those kinds of things? Well, there's there's hints of it already. We're starting to see some efforts in what I would call computational psychotherapy. And what I'm talking about in the systems here, this is going to push that even more. So short answer to your question is 
uh, I can already see opportunities for interdisciplinary work where I think we're going to bash people together and see what happens. This is an exciting time to try things out. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I see a question that's come up here as well that with regards to hardware, you, uh, sorry, Google using uh, specialized hardware. You're absolutely correct that uh, there, there is useful accelerators on the edge. Uh, we've got a thing called True North, which is building a low-powered, uh, massive neural network out of silicon. Uh, GPU certainly can take us a long way as well. So the hardware world is not over by any means. I mean, look even at Alexa. Uh, there is some really amazing engineering that was done by taking some pretty low-cost microphones and doing some signal processing at the edge that allows you to build a really inexpensive device that does some powerful things. So that's a great example of computation at the edge that Google has discovered lots of other people are moving to in that space. Uh, I see another question about uh, what's currently missing. Um, wow, let's see. Uh, Dorian, maybe um, we could chat with that person offline because that's a longer thing unto itself. How could you have an assistant follow you around? Um, the short answer I'll give the question is by actually separating the notion of models, which is knowledge that's sort of out there, from the soul of the persona, which is where the agency is, from the perception, having those separate actually makes it possible to put a persona out there but give a sense of presence in there by moving the perceptual context in and out. So that's the short answer. And indeed, the ability to move a persona around is one of the use cases that drove the particular architecture that we have now. We think it is possible and have actually demonstrated that to some degree. Uh, Grady, uh, yeah, one other question is, do you see any particular low-hanging fruit areas where you could make progress now and sort of incre incrementally build on it? Uh, it looks like elder care might be a good example of that. Yes, and actually, Barry, let me go back a few slides here do, 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 to these use cases on slide, slide 17. So um, we're actually doing implementations in every one of those use cases pretty much simultaneously. So um, heavily driven by use cases and what we're doing in this particular work. And so I've got teams in, scattered around the world that are actually advancing implementations in every one of these. So in trying to bring together the learnings from them to see you know, what can we steal and borrow from one place and put into another. That's great. Oh, and uh, Grady, yeah. I don't know if the Q&A, uh, Curtis Awada. I'm actually going to unmute you, Curtis, if you want to ask directly. Sure, thank you. Um, so I come from a systems engineering background studying MBSC, and I was wondering in where the intersection of or the role of structured information in representing information in a structured way, how that fits in with neural networks which are more um, unstructured or it basically learns structure on its own. Do we see us teaching right. specific structures? Uh, please. You bet. So you are exactly correct that one of the hallmarks of a neural network is that those kinds of structures are not necessarily made manifest. Now, as you may have read in some of the work that Google has done with their translation systems, it appears that those neural networks are building their own representations inside, which their own sort of meta language, which I think is utterly amazing, but we don't necessarily know how to interact with those kinds of things. So I think it is true, and certainly brain science shows us that uh, neural networks of a, uh, certain, uh, of a certain level of complexity, once you reach that threshold of complexity, all of a sudden they start structuring themselves in some interesting ways. We just don't know how to read them. This is why we're, we're carefully watching what's going on with the, uh, the EU brain, brain project and things like what uh, Jeff Hawkins and others have done as we learn from the, the neural networks of the mind. But, but let me be very clear. The way we're going about understanding neural networks of the mind is like me putting 
an ohm meter, a uh, volt meter, on a router of my home in trying to infer how the internet works. We have a long way to go there. So that's why for today, we're trying to bash together symbolic systems for which we know how to build those kinds of specific models, models together with the best we know how to do with neural networks, which is signal AI, some degree of decision AI, and therefore put all models explicitly in the symbolic case where we have you know, decades of knowledge of how to manipulate those and as best we can feed in what we can on the neural network side. So I'll be honest in saying that in the end, it's going to be a neural network most likely. You and I are instances of that, but for right now, the pragmatic engineering solution for the foreseeable decade is let's bash together neural networks and symbolic systems together. Actually, this is where, I, by the way, the, the notion of models of, of the world, models of others, and models of self come to be, because these are largely symbolic, explicit models. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is where knowledge graphs tend to live in this system. <clears throat> And I'm wondering if that kind of ties into uh, Johannes Gross's uh, question. I don't know if you see that there, about elaborating on the integration between the symbolic systems and the neural net. I'm sorry, can you play that question, play that statement again? I, I, oh, uh, sure, my sure. My mind uh, someplace else. <laughs> no worries. Um, Johannes Gross was asking if, we, if uh, you could elaborate on the integration between the symbolic systems and neural nets, which I know you kind of started to uh, enter into, but asking for an sure. example. Um, let me give you an example of that. Okay, um, the notion of a sensory fusion, and, and I will need to drop off for a moment in another call here. Uh, the notion of sensory fusion. So I can use a neural network that I can train to a classifier that can identify humans. I can build a classifier that can identify your voice. I can build a classifier that identifies your specific face. Those are all neural networks that I would build. But now I'm going to take those individual things and I'll weave them together with an agent in a blackboard system that takes the individual bits of information I can get from those classifiers and begins to infer in the traditional symbolic logic sense as to it's actually you and you're in this location. So that particular use case, I think, is a good example of where we're applying neural networks at the edge together with traditional symbolic inference. Oh, fantastic. And the, in, in, in general, what the, the short answer is the neural networks uh, contribute to putting information they know in real time on the blackboard that then the symbolic systems can pick up opportunistically. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's an hour unto itself as well. I can give you a, I can give you a, a, a uh, an object diagram, and no surprise, I've actually used the UML to document my architecture. <laughs> I, yeah, and I, and I, know I do need to run to another call. Yeah, absolutely, but, Grady, uh, thank you so much for for your time. Uh, if anybody has additional questions, please send them to me. Um, and Grady, I know it, uh, your time is. Um, rather limited, so I'll, I'll send them along if you're okay with that, and then as you're able to answer, we, we can trans, uh, transfer that. My pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. thanks Thank again, Greg. This has been a real mind-expanding mind experience listening to you, so really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Bye now. Thank you so much. For so whoever is still on, uh, uh, the bottom uh, – slide on uh, in the presentation says, yeah, what are the next two uh, talks in this series? And uh, the next one is April 5th, where Paul Rosenblum, uh, who has been working on machine learning since he was uh, a grad student and then uh, assistant professor at, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, was working on with Alan Newell and some of the pioneers in, in AI. Uh, and is making a lot of progress in looking at graphical models as a way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, achieving general intelligence. Uh, and you heard Kevin Sullivan as, uh, asking questions. Uh, he's also a part of the CERC and um, uh, is uh, uh, developing approaches for cyber social learning systems. So uh, we'll uh, look forward to your uh, tuning in on, on the rest of these.